We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Thank you, thank you. Hey, good morning, church. It's great to see us all gathered together. I always love Sundays. They're, they're my favorite, favorite day of the week. Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and um, I'd love to meet you after, after service. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet out in the lobby, maybe we can shake hands or something like that. But you've joined us on a day that we call Mission Sunday. And believe it or not, this is actually the last Mission Sunday we're going to do at ACC. And it might sound like, wait, what? Why are we not going to do Mission Sunday anymore? Well, the reason why is one of the things that we've been realizing as a staff and as a leadership is that when we have a one kind of Sunday a year set aside as a Mission Sunday, it really feels like missions is something that we do instead of who we are. And it's, it should be more part of our DNA. So what we're going to do is we're going to shift our mindset uh, to, to understand that missions and the concept of missional work, we're called to live missional lives. It should be part of everything we do. I had I put out a little survey on Facebook earlier this week, and many of you uh, were gracious enough to participate. And the question was, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the word missions? And for a lot of us, uh, things like, you know, a foreign experience or a short-term trip or something like that, for a couple of you, Mission Barbecue is what came to mind first. Uh, but here's the point. For a lot of us, when we hear the word missions, what we think of is stuff that happens far away from here, stuff that we have to get on an airplane to accomplish, things that we have to get on a 15-passenger bus uh, or a 15-passenger van to accomplish, and, and, or we think about those short-term trips and the missionaries out there doing that work. And that's, that's good because that is all mission work, but at the end of the day, what we need to shift in our mindset as a church is that, like it says, mission shouldn't be something that we do, it should be who we are. We should all be living missional lives. It should be part of our, our DNA to recognize that when you walk out of these doors, you're entering the mission field. When you pull out of this parking lot, you're pulling out into the mission field. In fact, really, as you sit in here right now, you're technically in the mission field because I, I, I doubt that every single person in this room right now loves Jesus the way uh, God would love to have them love his son. And so what I mean is, is that we're all called to be living missional lives. And we're going to work missions really into the more of the heartbeat and the DNA of every week of who we are and what we do um, so with that in mind, let me break some myths. Missions, okay, isn't just something that missionaries do. It's not just something that happens somewhere else in a foreign country. It's not just something that happens after you spend some money and you get into a 15-passenger van and travel, right? That's not what missions is. Missions is uh, kind of the calling that God has given each and every one of us, all of us in this room, are missionaries, every single one of us. And we get this concept of mission work, this mission that God has called each of us to through a passage of scripture that we call the Great Co-Mission, the Great Commission. In fact, let me show you the, the most popular Great Commission verse that most of you have probably heard before is the last two verses in the book of Matthew. And it's Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And here's what it says. It says, there, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right, it says then to, to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is what we call the Great Commission. This is the last words of Christ as he's speaking to his disciples, right? He's speaking to them. This is the last command he's given to the church. It's, it's what he's told each of us in this room to be a part of. It's important. 
And one of the ways we, we know that it's important is because we, we hear the Great Commission often, and it's been written down multiple times. I heard this, this story recently. There's an older man and his wife, and they're getting kind of later on in their years. And they're starting to realize they are having trouble with their memory. So they go together, and they make an appointment, and they go see their doctor. And their doctor says, listen, this just happens as you get older. I recommend that you start writing things down as you're making decisions and deciding what to do, just write, write yourself a note. It'll help, it rem- it'll help you remember it, and if you forget it, you'll have it written down. So that night, the husband and wife are sitting in the family room, and the husband gets up and he says, I'm going into the kitchen uh, to get some ice cream. Would you like some ice cream? And she says, yes, I would love some vanilla ice cream. And so he starts walking, and she says, honey, you should write that down. You should write it down. He says, ah, I'm not going to forget vanilla ice cream. She says, well, I want my vanilla ice cream with whipped cream. He says, vanilla ice cream, whipped cream, vanilla ice cream, whipped cream. She says, why don't you just write it down? He says, no, I'm not going to forget that. She says, well, I would like you to sprinkle some, some peanuts on it and a cherry. And he says, that's fine. That's fine. She says, just write it down. He says, no, vanilla ice cream with whipped cream, peanuts and cherry, vanilla ice cream. And he walks into the kitchen and about 20 minutes later, he walks out with a plate full of, of eggs and bacon. And she said, I knew you were going to forget the toast. Stupid joke. But hey, listen. One of the reasons that we know things are important is because what do we do with important things? We repeat them. We say them over and over again because they're important enough to be repeated, and we write them down. And the Great Commission, we know that it's important because it has been written down, and in fact, it's been repeated. Do you know that every gospel has its version of the Great Commission? And there's another version of it in the book of Acts. Let me show you. So this is Matthew Right? In, in Mark, it says this, and then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Remember, this is a command to all Christ followers to follow Christ into all the world to preach the good news to everyone. Luke 24 says, and then he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. And it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. I love how this, you see the gospel put into one passage of scripture, and it's a reminder that we're called to take that gospel into all the world, all of us. Then it says in John 20, verse 21, it says, again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then we also get another one in the book of Acts. Acts 1, verse 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, that's your local community, Throughout Judea, that's kind of like your, your, your region. In Samaria, that's the parts of, uh, that you don't really want to go to, the parts that you, you, you would rather avoid, and to the ends of the earth. We're called to take the gospel not just there, but here. We're called to take the gospel not just here and not just there, but everywhere in between. We're all called to go. In fact, if you're in this room and you call yourself a follower of Christ— Well, then the last command of Christ, he tells you where to follow him to. He says, take this good news and take it and go and take it to all the nations. In other words, every single one of us in this room, if you are a follower of Christ, you are a missionary. You can't get around it. I recognize that there are people who missionary is their job title. Like they get paid by a missions organization and maybe they have some special training to do something specific. But at the end of the day, every single one of us has been called to be part of this great commission. We're all called to do it. Everyone is called to go. So if you have a copy of God's word, I want to show you plainly in scripture different ways that we can live this out. And if you have your copy, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter If you don't have a copy of God's Word, I want you to have one. So grab the Bible from underneath the chair in front of you, write your name in it, and take it home with you. We'll put one back in that spot um, after you leave. We want you to own a Bible, all right? 
So everyone in this room, take your copy now of God's word and go to 1 Peter and hang out there. All of our passages today, except for one, are gonna be out of 1 Peter. Here's why 1 Peter is important, by the way. 1 Peter is written to a group of Christ followers who are living in a context that is not comfortable. They're living as exiles. They're living in a culture and a world where Christianity is not widely accepted. Does that sound familiar, anybody? All right? They're living in a place where it's not the, the, the cool thing. It's not the, 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 the right thing to be a follower of Christ. And that's where they're living. So in that context, Peter is writing this group of people living in exile, and he's telling them, here's how to do this thing called being, to, to, to live sent. You see that with me? Will you guys say that with me? Live sent. To say it one more time, louder than first service. Live sent. All of us in this room are called to live sent. Every element of our lives, all of our decisions, all of our actions, all of our words should be those of a missionary on mission because that's what we've been called to do. And 1 Peter shows a group of people living in exile how to pull this off. How do we live sent? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, says this, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. Real fast, so I can make sure everyone in this room knows who this verse is about. If you're a follower of Christ... If right now you have, you're, you're sitting here and you know you've made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, this verse is about you. Are you ready for this? It says, you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. What Peter is saying is that you, who are a chosen people, you have the ability to, to show other people the goodness of God. In other words, you have the ability to live sent on mission. We're all called to tell people about the goodness of God, and we have the ability to show people the goodness of God just by the way we live our lives. So here's how we do it. Number one, if you're taking notes, living sent means living differently. It means living differently. In other words, you should really stick out as a follower of Christ living in a broken world. Have you ever seen one of those movies or sitcoms where an alien is trying to fit in. They've taken on human form and they're trying to fit in in American culture. And, and what happened, the reason those are all funny, right, is because they have a really hard time fitting in. They say the wrong phrases, they use the wrong gestures, right? They, whatever they do, it just doesn't make, they look odd. You can tell that they're not from around here. That's how we're called to live as followers of Christ. We're called to live in such a way that when people look at our lives, they can say, wow, you're not from around here. This must not be your home. This must not be your culture. Like, the, the, you must be, home must be somewhere else for you. We're called to live differently, to stand out in that way. In fact, we're called to be weird. You know, one of the greatest compliments you could ever say to one of my kids is call them Weird. When my kids come to me and say that someone called them weird, I'm like, man, that's awesome. That's great. That's actually one of the goals of, of my wife and I is to raise really weird kids. Not weird just to be weird. We don't want them just to be weird without purpose. We want them to stand out for the sake of Christ, that their friends see something different about them. I want you to be weird in your workplace. I want you to be the one who's like always happy and the one who handles trouble with grace and the one who doesn't fight back and, and try to climb the ladder over someone else's back the way everyone else does. I want you to be weird because living sent means living differently. It says in 1 Peter 2, <clears throat> verse 11, dear friends, I want to warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. You hear what they're being called? Followers of Christ are being called basically alien residence. This isn't your home. This isn't where you're supposed to live forever. You're supposed to be a little bit weird in this context. 
It says to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. You see, the simplest form of evangelism is what we just call lifestyle evangelism. You live so differently that people see the goodness of God through your life. And we live in a culture right now that really wants people, people want to stand out. I mean, you think about what the height of fashion is right now for young people. You take things that don't go together. You make the weirdest outfit you can and you put it together and somehow that's now like the fashion, right? Whatever you can do to stand out. So we as followers of Christ, we gotta stand out. We got, really gotta stand out. We gotta be super weird in the way we live our lives. And as you keep reading in 1 Peter, we don't have time to read it all, but I encourage you to read it at home. It goes on into detail about doing good and living right and respecting the rules around you and respecting laws and showing grace, etc. There's one verse in 1 Peter 3 that kind of summarizes some of this. It says, for scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, real fast, uh, uh, who wants to enjoy life and live many happy days? Come on, everybody. That's everybody. All right, who wants to enjoy life, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. In other words, do all the things that everyone else seems to do the opposite. Be weird, live different. It says, then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior. You see the simplest form, I already read that one, didn't I? It says, uh, search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right and his ears are open to their prayers. You know, one, one verse I like even better than this one is 1 Peter 2.17. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. I love how this verse shows you how to live differently and it's very simple in that it's for points all crammed into one really short verse. Here's how to live differently. You want to see it? Really simple. Number one, you value other people. Number two, you love your family of believers. You treat each other within the body of Christ even better and with more honor than anyone else. Number three, you fear God. And number four, you respect the authorities around you. You follow the rules. Now, I'll show you that real quick, the value other people. This simply means to put value on other people. You, 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 you value them. You, you place them as higher than you place yourself. You give up your spot. You know one of the, the, the hardest times it is to open a door for someone else? I mean, normally, if you're opening up the door for someone at the grocery store, it's no big deal, right? You're all going different directions. But you open the door for someone at Kadoba. You know what that means, right? They're going into line where you were supposed to be in line. Like you're giving up your spot. You open up the door for someone at the MVA, right? They're getting in line ahead of you. Like this, these are things where you say, listen, I want to value other people more highly than I value myself. I want to be able to sacrifice and serve other people. And when you do that, you're going to stick out. And then there's this other one, right? We, the second thing in that 1 Peter 2.17 is to cherish the body of Christ. In other words, outsiders should look in at the way the church treats the church, the way we love each other and care about each other. And they should want to be part of what's going on on the inside of the body of Christ. The third one is fearing God. It should be really simple. People should be able to recognize about the way you live your life, that you honor God, you fear him, you respect him that you recognize his power and his might and his rightness, that you're willing to worship him without shame. And that fourth one in in 1 Peter 2.17 is to respect authority. It simply means, listen, if there's a policy at work, if you're supposed to be at work at a certain time and nobody seems to follow that, you can actually stand out by simply following the policy and showing up when you're supposed to. You can follow rules that the authorities have placed on you, and by doing so in this world, you'll stand out. You'll stand out. Let me kind of boil this first point down to to this. If you were on trial for being a Christian, 
would there be enough evidence to convict you? Do you live differently enough that if somebody put you on trial for being a follower of Christ, that they'd actually have things they could point at that show that you are different, that you are a follower of Christ? Or would there be not enough evidence and you'd get off? Let there be enough evidence to convict you for being a follower of Christ. Number two, living sent means living graciously. Here's what I mean by this. If you think about the way the world responds to hurt, the way the world responds to hatred and anger, when somebody does you wrong, right, what do you want to do back? You want revenge, right? If you, you say something bad to me, well, I'm going to say something bad to you. You show me a certain finger in the car, well, I want to show you that finger right back, right? We want to get even. That's the way the world works. But living sent means living graciously. It means acting in a way that people at, at work, when they're crawling over each other's backs and backbiting and backstabbing and all those things, you're just saying, you know what, I'm going to do things differently around here. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, so you must follow in his steps. One of the best examples we have of what it means to live graciously is to allow someone to do something to you that you didn't earn or deserve, and to show grace in return is clearly in the person of Jesus Christ who took on the cross for each one of us, not expecting anything in return. And then it goes on in 1 Peter to talk about living gracious lives in marriage. And then we get to 1 Peter 3, 9. that says, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do. Think about that for a moment. God's word says that when someone insults you, the best way to get even is with a blessing. Just be honest for a moment. Will that cause you to stand out in this world? If you're blessing those who have hurt you, blessing those who have cursed you, you're saying, listen, I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not going to play this game. I'm just going to love you in return. That's what Jesus did for me. It's going to be weird. You know the result of these first two, right? When you live sent by living, uh, you know, graciously, and when you live sent by living differently, something is going to happen that you're going to notice will happen. And we see it in 1 Peter 3.15. I want you to look in your copy of God's Word. Look at 1 Peter 3.15. It's the second part I really want you to focus on, but the first part says, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And then it says this, and if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. I, I love what this, this verse says. It says that when you live differently and that when you live graciously, you're going to stand out in such a weird way that people are going to be curious. They're going to want to know why you're always so happy, why you don't respond the way everyone else does, why you're a little bit different. And they're going to ask you, they're going to come up to you and say, why are you different? Can you give me a reason for the hope that you have? And the Bible says that in those moments of evangelism, we get to then share our faith. We get to say, well, let me tell you why I act differently. It's because Jesus has changed my life. Let me tell you about Jesus. In fact, I encourage people, if you don't ever have anyone coming up to you asking you to explain why you're different, then maybe you're not living differently enough. If you don't live in such a way in your neighborhood where you're known as that house that just does things and loves people differently than everyone else, maybe you're not standing out the way God's calling you to. If in your workplace, in your family, around the Thanksgiving table, if you're not loving people, serving people, acting differently enough where people recognize it enough that they've got to know what the secret is, I want to encourage you to consider maybe you're not living differently enough or graciously enough. Here's a third thing. Living sent means living intentionally. Living sent 
means living intentionally. Here's what I mean by this. Being a missionary doesn't just happen on accident. You don't just find yourself in Honduras on a go adventure and think, where, how in the world did I get here? No, it takes some planning. It takes some rearranging of your calendar. It takes a talk with your boss. It takes some fundraising. It takes some work to be able to go on a go adventure. It doesn't happen on accident. You don't just find yourself across the street mowing your neighbor's lawn on accident. It takes some planning. It takes some thinking. It takes some strategy of how can I live with intentional, how can I intentionally be different? How can I intentionally be gracious? How can I serve people the way Jesus would intentionally? I, listen, I'm all about random acts of kindness. I get the whole concept of a random act of kindness, but wouldn't it be cool if we were living so intentionally that our lives were just acts of kindness after act of kindness, that we were just living lives of kindness, that that was part of our strategy. And at the end of the day, listen, God has created you and gifted you to do things better than anyone else. He's given you special gifts, and he gave those gifts for you to use in serving others. Let me show you this. In 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, it says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. And then it says this, use them well to serve yourself. No? It doesn't say that at all, does it? It says use them well to serve one another. The reason God has given you the gifts that he's given you is not so you can make much of your name. It's not so that you can make much of your bank account. It's not so you can make much of your Twitter following. It's, not so, he can, it's so that you can use those gifts to make much of Jesus. That's why he's given you those gifts, to serve other people for the sake of fulfilling the Great Commission and building the kingdom of God. Listen, it goes on, it says, do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever, amen. I love how it has the word amen up there. Do you know what the word amen means? You know why it's, it's really kind of encouraging sometimes when someone out there yells out amen? Because amen simply means, so be it. Yes, let's do it. Right? So when we say, listen, let's serve in such a way that if God has given us the ability to be a, a help to others, and let's help them with all the strength that God gives us. Let's do it like that for God's glory. Amen. Right? It's saying, yes, let's go be that kind of church. Let's be that family. Let's be that person. Let's live with intentionality and make a difference for the kingdom of God. Let's live sent. The last one is living sent means living boldly. Living sent means living boldly. Have you ever heard this, this quote before? If you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard this. It, it says, uh, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Have you heard that before? Let me tell you why I don't like that quote at all. People come to a saving knowledge of, of the gospel and understand the gospel only through the name of Jesus Christ spoken out of a mouth. If you believe, right, that you can just be kind and live differently and live graciously and live intentionally and mow these lawns and do this and serve people and open doors and all that stuff, but that you never actually have to open your mouth and tell people about the saving work of Jesus Christ, then you're missing something. All of those other things are great. That's all lifestyle evangelism, but sometimes we get to this point where we cop out and we kind of get to this point where, well, I, I share about Jesus through my actions. That's great, but eventually we've got to open our mouth and tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. We've got to open our mouth and tell them about how Jesus has changed our life. Listen, certainly preach the gospel at all times. Certainly preach the gospel with your life. Certainly do all one, two, and three. But at the end of the day, living sin also means opening your mouth and living boldly. Telling people about Jesus without shame. First Peter 4, 
Verse 12 starts. It says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery troubles you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. And verse 16 says, But it is no shame, no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. You know, one of the things I've learned is that one of the, the main reasons that people don't open their mouth and tell people about Jesus is they're afraid of rejection. They're afraid to look weird in their workplace. They're afraid of what everyone will think about their, their home in the neighborhood. Oh, they're the weird, you know, Bible thumpers. They're the, you know, we're, we're afraid to, we're ashamed of the gospel. But Paul says in Romans 1, 6, he says, for I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is a power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Here's what I'm trying to say, is that living sin does also mean living boldly. It's not being apologetic for the fact that Jesus has changed your life. In fact, you should have your life so radically changed that you can't wait to allow Jesus to change the lives of people you love around you. And you want to open your mouth and tell them about Jesus. So we're at that point where we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with this information? That's simply that three-word prayer, what now, God? I hope you're praying this. When you see these words pop up on the screen on a Sunday, I hope right now in this moment you're asking yourself, God, what do you want me to do with this? If you feel a little bit of a poke or a prod or like God's prompting you to do something with this information, simply ask him, say, God, what do you want me to do differently? Listen, we, let's not be that church that hears messages, right? And we say, okay, that's good. And then we walk out and don't apply anything to our lives. Let's do something with it. And this is where you ask, God, what do you want me to do with this? And I remember living sent means living as a missionary wherever you go. It means living, it means going wherever you are. It means wherever God has placed you that you're being intentional about being gospel oriented and fulfilling the Great Commission. So if God calls you to go on a short term mission trip, go. Intentionally rearrange some things. You can go on one of those adventures outside of your context. If God calls you to go across the street, and to get to know your neighbor and to invite them over for a meal, do it, go, say yes. If God calls you, right, to walk a cubicle across from you and just tell someone, hey, I've been meaning to tell you about my church, do it. If God calls you to support a vocational missionary and say, listen, there's other people who God has called them for a full-time job to serve in missions work, and I wanna be able to support that. Write a check, do it. Wherever it is, whenever and wherever God commands, go. We have all been called. Let's pray together. God, let us be a church, a, a, a community of faith that recognizes we are called to live differently. We are called to live graciously. We are called to live intentionally. And we are called to live boldly in the way we live out our faith. And that by doing those things, we're actually missionaries everywhere we go. Every word that comes out of our mouth should serve the purpose of fulfilling the Great Commission. God, we know that you are glorified in the building of your kingdom, in the building of, of this body of faith. And we want to tell people about the good work that you've done in our lives. God, allow us to be a church that lives sent. Allow us to leave this parking lot today and to recognize that as we cross that threshold onto Aqua Heart Road, that we are missionaries on a mission field. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers. 
other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.